Hello everyone, it's Darren DeVivo and welcome to Things We Said Today. It's a Beatles video cast podcast. We discuss anything and everything about the Beatles together and apart. Uh, we come to you, we try to make it every other week. And we have a special guest today uh, that we're going to uh, talk uh, talk to, an author who's been here before. But um, he has a brand new book and we'll let you in on that in a few minutes you probably already know who it is, but but uh, let me take this opportunity uh, to uh, say hi. I'm from WFUV Radio. I've uh, been on the air at WFUV for close to 40 years, and uh, that's basically been my career, broadcasting career. And and it's a, it's a pleasure getting to hang out with you every other week to talk about the Beatles with my friends, Ken Michaels, Ken, the host of the syndicated radio show, Every Little Thing, co-host of the Paul McCartney pod. No, it's the Solo Beatles podcast. I think I once said that it was McCartney. You corrected me, and now for the rest of, I think, eternity, I'll get that all fouled up. Meanwhile, I watch the show. You would think that. But uh, Ken's one of the hosts of Talk More Talk, which concentrates on the solo years of the four Beatles. Uh, I mentioned Every Little Thing. There's also Ken Michaels Radio, which is a YouTube channel where Ken does his own thing, solo, doing interviews and uh, having guests on that we don't get to uh, do here or on Talk More Talk. So Ken's all over the place. He's 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 like, you know, he's like he's like dust. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome uh, my good friend, Ken, Dusty Ken Michaels. I never no worry, Ken. tried that way, but thank you, Darren. It's always a pleasure working with you. And uh, your confusion with the Talk More Talk podcast and the Two Legs podcast, that could be like your string of pilates. Yeah, exactly. That's now, now, but now that it's happened, it's I'm going to constantly be doing that. <laughs> um, speaking of dust, uh, my other friend and co-host here on Things We Said Today, Alan Kozin, the premier authority on uh, Paul McCartney and the Beatles. Uh, Alan co-authored with uh, Adrian Sinclair, The McCartney Legacy, Volume 1, has been out now for not quite, almost a year. Volume 2 is very much on the horizon uh, of this multi-volume uh, history of McCartney. Alan's credentials speak for themselves. Uh, decades writing for the New York Times, uh, not just about pop music and the Beatles, but classical music as well. And uh, these days you could read his, read his work in a bunch of different periodicals, one comes to mind immediately, the Wall Street Journal and the New York Times still. And, uh, of course, a lot of the attention, though, now is on uh, the McCartney legacy. So, Alan Cozen, great to have you here again. How are you, Alan? Good, Darren. And hello, Ken. And hello, everyone out there. And um, my goal here with opening this show up was to make the introduction very brief, which I didn't do. Uh, so thank you for sitting through my introduction. Now we get into the meat and potatoes because we're throwing it over to Ken Michaels, or I'm going to throw it to Ken Michaels. And Ken's got the news. What's the word, Ken? Okay, thanks, Darren. First of all, uh, we have to start the news with the obvious um, two major passings since our last show. First, there's the death of Gary Wright, the musician keyboard player best known for his hits of the 70s dream weaver and love is alive he had a career uh being in the british blues rock band spooky tooth and later a solo career he began working with george harrison through his connection with klaus Vormann, who played on gary's first solo album and um also of course klaus played on all things must pass and from Gary working with George on All Things Must Pass, that formed a friendship that went beyond the music as they shared a common interest in Indian philosophy and spirituality, which became a big part of Gary's music. Gary played on many of George's other albums, including Living in the Material World, Dark Horse, Extra Texture, 33 and a Third, the George Harrison album, and Cloud Nine. And Harrison played under the pseudonym George O'Hara on Gary's 1971 album Footprint on the songs Two-Faced Man and Stand for Our Rights. Gary formed a band that year which was called Wonder Wheel. And George joined the band live when they played the song Two-Faced Man on the Dick Cavett Show. 
George and Gary wrote a song together at that time called To Discover Yourself, which was never released until 2010, when Gary put out an album called Connected, and To Discover Yourself was only available on the iTunes version, and he actually recorded that song on the day that George died. However, on George's solo albums, you'll find two songs that Gary co-wrote with George, If You Believe, from the George Harrison album from 1979, and That's What It Takes, from Cloud Nine, also co-written by Jeff Lynn. For Ringo Starr, he played on his hit singles at Don't Come Easy and Back Off Boogaloo, and played on his Goodnight Vienna album, and he was a member of Ringo Starr and his all-star band in 2008, and he was also in the band in 2010 and 11. Not only that, on Ringo's Why Not album from 2010, Gary co-wrote a song with Ringo Stream. He released his own autobiography, Dreamweaver, Music, Meditation, and My Friendship with George Harrison. Gary was suffering from Parkinson's disease and Lewy body dementia. Another tremendous loss. Gary was 80 years old. Very sad to hear that. Mm -hmm. Too many people have played on so many George Harrison albums as Gary Wright. And uh, he was also a pioneer in electronic music. Um, the Dreamweaver album was just keyboards and drums. And that's it. So, uh, yeah. yeah. Dabbled in world music also a little bit mm -hmm. um, later in his career and was a New Jersey native. That's right. Yeah. Which, which you forget because you connect him to the Beatles were specifically George Harrison, and you forget that he's a New Jersey guy. Right. And I've had the pleasure of seeing him live many times with Ringo and the All-Stars and uh, on his own as a solo artist. Great, uh, great musician, really great singer. Loved his mm. voice. We also mourn the loss, of course, of Jimmy Buffett, the singer-songwriter best, best known for his hits Margaritaville and Cheeseburger in Paradise. In an article in UltimateClassicRock.com in 2020, Jimmy said that he and Paul McCartney became friends knowing each other in St. Bart's. And their wives became friends. Um, at the time, Jimmy was working on his album called Life on the Flip Side. Buffett said he and Paul played a show together, and Paul gave him some feedback on his songs. Paul said, let it breathe a little more. Just kind of let it go along and make it light. Jimmy was quite honored that he was getting advice from Paul McCartney on his songwriting. Paul appeared on Jimmy's new album, playing bass on the song My Gummy Just Kicked In. The title came from a dinner party where Paul's wife Nancy stumbled towards the dinner table. Jimmy asked if she was all right, and Nancy said, I'm okay. My gummy just kicked in. Paul gave one of his lengthiest tributes ever online after hearing of Jimmy's yeah. past, calling him one of the kindest and most generous people. In fact, Paul performed for Jimmy and his family a week before he passed. Jimmy's new album is due out November 3rd called Equal Strain on All Parts. And you can listen to that new song, My Gummy Just Kicked In, online. In fact, there's even a new video that was made with Jimmy and Paul and other musicians in the studio performing the song, which you can now watch on YouTube. Jimmy Buffett died from a four-year battle with Merkel cell carcinoma, a rare but aggressive form of skin cancer. And he was 76. You know, I'd seen pictures of, of Paul with Jimmy, had no idea they were that close. And, you know, so many people in Beatles history, when they pass away, Paul usually gives some kind of tribute. And this was one of the longest I've ever seen. Yeah, uh, yeah definitely. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> there, there was that East End of Long Island connection in there. I always forget that, uh, that Jimmy Buffett lived in Sag Harbor, uh, which is on the east end of long island uh and paul mccartney uh, is always in east hampton uh which is just you know five minute drive so that probably helped the friendship along but that's sad sad news yeah have you both heard the song yes and what it's you fun. think it's fun it's fun it's light <laughs> it's jimmy buffett yeah i mean you know jimmy buffett you, you know <clears throat> Jimmy Buffett's one of those artists. I, I often say the same thing about ACDC. You know what you're going to get. It's going to be good. They're not going to surprise you. They're not going to disappoint you. Okay. Well played. Okay. 
Uh, don't forget Ringo Starr's new EP, Rewind Forward, comes out on October 13th. And Ringo, when the All-Stars are already back on the road touring the U.S., which they started September the 15th, runs through October the 13th. Speaking of Ringo, there's a brand new song from the group Pentatonix called Happy Birthday Beautiful. And Ringo actually shares the artist credit on the record. The song was written by Diane Warren, who's written a number of songs now for Ringo. And she asked him if he'd drum on the song, which he does. You can check it out on YouTube, Happy Birthday Beautiful by Pentatonix and Ringo Starr. We are now entering an age here. And this just happened with Dolly Parton's new recording of Let It Be. Because the artist on the record is Dolly Parton featuring Paul McCartney and Ringo Starr. Now, Paul doesn't sing any lead vocals. He does background vocals on it, plays piano, and Ringo drums on it. But they're listed as artists on the record. So here's Ringo just drumming on the Pentatonix record, and he's sharing the artist credit with Pentatonix. It's the trend these days. I joke with my friend, my, my, my kids, you know, a, a hip hop, hip hop, but yeah. Hip hop artist or rap artist puts out a song, a single comes out. It's always like um, so and so featuring boom, 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 boom. There's all these people adding on. And I'm like, I, I tease them. I said, can't these guys do something by themselves? Do they need help from everybody in the neighborhood? But I think the power of the name Ringo Starr, you know, to have that in the artist credit. You know, may help the record sell, but, um, you know, it's prestige. Let's face it. Um, the search is on for an important part of rock history. You've probably heard about this. Paul McCartney's first bass guitar, his original Hoffner bass. Paul bought the bass for 30 pounds or $38 in Hamburg, Germany in 1961, and it disappeared eight years later. The BBC is reporting that the hunt is on after Paul asked the Hoffner company to track down his beloved instrument. Paul used this bass on many of the Beatles' early recordings, like Love Me Do and She Loves You. Nick Watts is hitting Hoffner's special project, and he's joined forces with two BBC journalists to solve the, quote, greatest mystery in the history of rock and roll says this is the base that made Beatles. This article from the BBC says Nick collaborated extensively with Paul and has written a book about the missing Hofner 501 violin bass. No one is certain what happened to the bass, which presumably was last used during the Beatles Get Back Let It Be sessions. Now, sort of related, while the search is on for Paul McCartney's early Hofner bass, one thing that was just found was a Patek, I hope I'm pronouncing it right, P-A-T-E-K, Philippe Watch. That, that was know? mine. Sorry, sorry. That... Uh, this was a watch that Yoko Ono gifted to John Lennon for his 40th birthday. It was discovered in Geneva. The timepiece is currently in possession of lawyers for an Italian watch collector who bought it from a now defunct German auction house, according to official legal documents from a Geneva court. A former driver for Yoko is suspected of stealing the watch a long time ago. In June, a Geneva court ruled that Yoko is the rightful owner of the watch, but the collector is appealing the case. Documents mention that there is an engraving on the watch which references a song that John and Yoko had composed together. Lawyers for Yoko said the watch could be worth up to four and a half million dollars, according to court documents. All right. We've been hearing about the Rolling Stones' upcoming album due out October 20th called Hackney Diamonds, the, their first studio album of original material in nearly 20 years since 2005's A Bigger Bang. Paul is said to be playing bass on one of the songs called Bite Your Head Off. And I'm also hearing that Paul played bass on a second Stone song, which looks like it'll come out on the Stones album that follows this one. But Hackney Diamonds will also include recordings the Stones made with their drummer Charlie Watts before his death. Again, that comes out October the 20th. Very exciting news to share right here. I'm really excited about this. A new book coming out in October in both hardcover and paperback is by Andrew James called Drumming is My Madness, The Ringo Starr Discography. This is a book that will cover all of Ringo Starr's music, from his first Beatle vocal in 1962, 
to the new releases of 2023 and everything in between. The book's website, ringodrumming.com, describes the book this way. Packed with facts, this book seeks to cover every song Ringo Starr has recorded or participated in. Scores, ratings, and reviews are included for curious listeners and diehard fans alike to immerse themselves in Ringo's catalog. Whether you are a longtime fan or you are new to Ringo's music and are looking for something to start, Drumming is My Madness, the Ringo Starr discography, is an indispensable volume for your music library. Thanks to John Bazzini and his Beatles blog for that. So this all comprehensive Ringo Starr book coming out in October. I'll try to find out more details for an exact date. Boy, this is this is a long time coming. Ringo really getting the star treatment here, getting his entire catalog covered. So including what I often referred to as side projects where he plays drums on other people's records or maybe helps to to co-write a song anything that he was involved with and uh it should be all covered in this book drumming is my madness the ringo uh, star discography one last thing here to mention uh julian lennon appeared on bill maher's podcast called club random and revealed that he and brother sean might be recording something together Julian is quoted saying, we've talked about it. We have a plan at some point. We both have the time to do it. Yes, there's something we want to do together. We want to play around with an idea. I think it's a nice idea. I have to wait and see. I'm not winding you up, but it'll have its time and place. Now, uh, I can tell you from seeing Julian several times at certain press events, especially the children's books that he's put out, he's been mentioning this for several years. So this is not exactly something new. So I certainly hope that it happens. I'd love to see the two of them together since they are brothers. They're both brilliant in their own way. Let's see if it indeed does happen. And that's all the news. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. And uh, it gives me great pleasure to welcome to the show, actually to welcome back to things we said today, author Steve Matteo, good friend of ours. Uh, I've known Steve for a number of years. Actually, we got to know each other through other avenues, not involving the Beatles. Um, but Steve, you've been on the show at least one other time, if not more than that. And yes. Steve has a new book, which is actually his third book, second on the Beatles. Uh, the first book was Let It Be, which was part of the, um, the 33 and a third series of books. Uh, who published those? Was it Continuum? It's a it's Bloomsbury, and uh, I just just happened to have a right. copy of it right here. <laughs> right. So, so that was uh, yeah. That was actually that was your second book. Right. right. My first your book first was on Bob Dylan. Right. Exactly. And when was that published? The Dylan book. Ninety six was it? Okay. All right. Or, no, no, 99. no. Ninety eight. Ninety eight. I'm sorry. Twenty five years. Twenty fifth anniversary. Yeah, there you go. And now comes Act Naturally, The Beatles on Film. I don't know if you can really see that, if it's backwards or not. Um, maybe this will help for some of you who might be standing <laughs> now. Uh, this is Steve Matteo's new book. That's Steve Matteo, and it gives us great pleasure to welcome Steve back to Things We Said Today. Thank you. And congratulations on the book, which actually was published a little earlier this year. Um, and it's uh, published by Backbeat Books. Um, you have been talking to me over the years, recent years, that you were going to do or wanted to do another Beatle book. You had ideas and whatnot. Um, talk about the, uh, how the plan came together to concentrate on the Beatles films for your book. Well, I always knew I would do another book on the Beatles, but honestly, I thought there would be some other books in between i've had some false starts over the years some ideas that i either didn't develop or they just didn't it just didn't seem like the right time to do it or you know whatever alan knows about these things as a, as an author how, how these things can go or not go mm -hmm. and then um i just thought you know it would be good to sort of to do something on the beatles i was feeling beatles again and i I just thought the films, there really hasn't been 
sort of a, you know, a trade paperback book or a trade book from a trade publisher uh, on all the films in a while. There's been some really great books. You know, I think the Roy Carr book is a, that's a fantastic book. People seem to really like that book. I love it. Um, But there hasn't been one in a while. And in particular, because as far as timing, there hasn't really been one since all of these reissues of the films on DVD and Blu-ray you know, the reissues of the soundtrack albums on vinyl and CD. And then with the Get Back series, it was sort of a slam dunk. And I knew this editor very well at Backbeat. And Backbeat now is actually, since before uh, I signed on to do this book, they're part of a larger publishing company called Roman and Littlefield. And so we've always kind of you know, talked about things through the years. He's always kind of asked me what I was up to. And so I ran into him at the book expo in the spring of 2019. And he was again, you know, what are you up to? And I actually told him, I said, you know, I actually do have an idea about doing a book on the films of the Beatles. I think maybe the time is right. And he immediately thought it was a great idea. And so obviously this is pre COVID. Um, and then I, you know, I started kind of working on it, uh, you know, as COVID was sort of hitting or, or actually maybe a few months before. And, uh, and then the, the, it kind of changed as far as the deadline and all of that, you know, with COVID changing the world and then with the Get Back series being delayed. So uh, I've always been interested in the idea of sort of, you know, where pop music meets film, you know, pop music meets visuals. So the, the whole idea of it really interested me. And I thought it would be more than a just a book on the Beatles. That's kind of how I envisioned it. And then it really mushroomed into being something even more than that. Mm-hmm. And you do venture off and touch on other aspects of music in film. When you started, when you start doing a book like this, which is going to have obviously in this case five movies, so five main sections. Um, do you begin at the beginning with something like this or are you free to maybe write numerous sections at the same time or uh, how do you, uh, you know, what was your, what was your attack uh, when you were starting, when you were writing a book? I mean, like with all my books, I think, and, and, and the articles that I write with the journalism, I mean, I think it all is kind of linear, you know, I, I mean, it's, that's just, it makes the most sense, you know, because you learn things, you know, in the beginning that then become important later, where if you do it out of sequence, it it just becomes confusing. I mean, I think this is how most nonfiction is written, unless the intention is to do it for whatever reason out of sequence. So no, it was definitely very much written in sequence. And as a matter of fact, there is, as you know, from reading it, uh, in the beginning, there is a lot of backstory on the sort of history of British cinema, you know, prior to the '60s, uh, I don't, I don't go all the way back to the beginning or anything like that. But I, I, I do touch on a lot of sort of just before a hard day's night in British cinema, you know, the late '50s and the early '60s. So um, it is, it is definitely a, you know, it is a historical linear narrative, very much so. It's, it's journalism. It's not, a, it's not. A, this is not revolution in the head this is not a critical you know my opinion analysis kind of book i mean i offer you know contextual analysis here and there very subtly but i I really did not approach this as a critic i approach this as a journalist as a maybe historian uh you know that was really that was really what i wanted to do it's what i prefer and I think it's 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 what I do. I don't consider myself really a critic. Right. Um, so could you tell us, for the sake of those who haven't read the book, um, in your research of early British cinema, the genesis of the idea of this pop phenomenon, the Beatles, uh, doing a film. I know that the Elvis Presley movies played a role in the decision to put the Beatles on the silver screen, but can you, in a, in a, in a nutshell, sum up the thinking behind? Hey, these guys would translate into uh, 
motion pictures very well. And thus, A Hard Day's Night, the idea has been planted. I mean, the, the, you, you mentioned Elvis, but I mean, there was a lot of pop music movies, you know, prior to A Hard right. Day's Night, many. Mm -hmm. And in particularly in, in the UK, there's the Cliff Richard films in right. particular. So, and, and then there was films that sort of, you know, maybe they weren't strictly pop music movies, but they sort of were, were in the same ballpark, you know, the beach movies mm -hmm. or, you know, movies where, you know, pop popular music or rock music people are, you know, part of the kind of the story or part of the backdrop or to add a certain youth element to a story. So, and I, and I go into this in great depth, as you know, in, in the book, but um, you know, I think there was a sense at first, you know, that this would just be a quickie pop music movie, mm -hmm. but more than that, and, and, and again, I don't want to repeat myself too much here, as you know, from reading the book, it really was United Artists wanting the soundtrack because Capital did not have rights technically to the soundtracks of, of movies the Beatles might do, which was another genius move by Capital Records in the early days of the Beatles. So uh, United Artists was uh, very aggressive in doing films with soundtracks. They had a whole division, United Artists Records, that had put out a lot of soundtracks. So this was something that they did a lot. It wasn't something new to them they knew that soundtracks could be lucrative um you know they had a, already had a catalog of them you know there was a sense obviously of you know pop groups they come and go so we'll we'll have the soundtrack we'll make some money from that and we'll we'll capitalize on it and you know there was no sense that a the beatles would be something that would last until today we're still we're here talking about them today and there was no sense that a hard day's night would in any way be an important film and would would launch the beatles even more than they are already had been launched through beatlemania so um it, it's one of these kind of happy accidents you know that it, it becomes this important film a really important film of the 60s that transcends popular music that transcends the Beatles and, you know, uh, the people involved, you know, Richard Lester, I think, you know, first and foremost, this is the beginning of his, it's not his first film as a director, but this is his really his breakthrough film as an important film director. Mm -hmm. right. All right. Well, let's go to the, uh, to Ken and to Alan and I uh, get some questions from them. I guess we'll start with, uh, with Ken. Well, I just wanted to bounce off what you were just talking about. I find it really extraordinary, and many is the time here on this show when we've commented about at the time, pop music was looked at as being, you know, an artist lasts just a few years, and that's it at the time. None of these artists would have any lasting value. And there's always the the classic interview with each of the Beatles where John is saying we could be big headed and say we're going to last for five years. But I find it extraordinary that Brian Epstein negotiated with United Artists for three films <laughs> with United Artists in October of 1963. I mean, there must have been some kind of mindset that, you know, this band might not last very long, you know, and yet three films seems like an awful lot so were was united artists only thinking about the soundtracks maybe we'll get three albums out of the beatles I, well, I think it's brian who is saying it, it's almost like a negotiating ploy or to some degree even though he didn't handle the negotiation for a hard day's night and the films in general very well as far as the beatles compensation and rights and things like that. But I think he looked at it as, you know, well, what do I have to lose here? You know, yeah, well, we want three films. And so United Artists could just say, okay, fine. You know, if that's what you want, it doesn't mean that the Beatles are going to actually go through with making three films or last long enough to make three films in three years. So I don't necessarily think it was United Artists 
thinking, gee, maybe these Beatles could last a long time. I just think it was Brian sort of trying to set things up. And, and maybe there was always some sense that, well, maybe it could be a film where the Beatles are part of the film, you know, or the Beatles are somehow involved in the film. They could make the music for it or whatever. I don't think there was a vision beyond, you know, let's just, let's just get a deal. I don't think there was any sense of, you know, anybody believing they were going to last ever. Although let's face it, Brian was the one who said the Beatles would be bigger than Elvis, which everybody thought was crazy. And of course he was completely correct. So, um, you know, I think with Brian, we go back and forth with him in terms of how was he as a manager? There's a lot of great things that he did for the Beatles. There's a lot of very smart things he did for the Beatles, but of course there's a lot of very bad deals that he made for the Beatles. There was also a lot of things that because he was a good person who tried to be honest and straight with people, as opposed to a lot of other people in the music business and show business in general, he, he, he didn't necessarily always make the best deal for the Beatles. You know what I'm saying? So, and I, and I think you all know that. So I, I don't think that anybody had any kind of grand scheme here of, of what the future will hold. I just think he just, this was part of the sort of negotiation, I think. And, and, and again, I think United Artists just said, sure, fine. You know, we have nothing to lose here. What do we have to lose? And if they don't fulfill the contract, that's okay. We don't, we don't mind. And they're certainly not going to hold us to anything if the Beatles aren't willing to fulfill the contract. So United Artists had nothing to lose in, in that negotiation. And these weren't expensive films to make at the time. No, not at all. But it's also extraordinary to me that this was all done before the Beatles were worldwide famous, <laughs> you know? Yes. Well, what that had a lot to do with was the fact that United Artists had a very strong presence in Europe and the UK. So they had a little different sort of a sense of the phenomenon of the Beatles. And, and that was a lot of what it was, is they saw this incredible phenomenon. Now, I don't think they necessarily knew for sure that it would translate to, to the United States the way that it did. But it was, you know, everything was kind of moving fast. Everything was happening kind of fast. So I think that that had a lot to do with it. The people involved with making these decisions were people either in the UK or in Europe. You know, United Artists, what was interesting about United Artists was unlike other sort of uh, film companies of the time is they really didn't have a film studio, you know, like Universal or Columbia, Warner Brothers, you know, the list is kind of endless, the American studios, or even many of the UK studios. They were very much a very nimble company who looked at m being more of a distributor. They would work out deals with people and they would make the film, not United Artists, the filmmakers would make the film and United Artists was essentially the distributor. It, you know what I'm saying? It wasn't like uh, they had a film lot and they had uh, directors and actors signed to long term deals in the like the old studio system. They were very much it's very much the way things are done today, the way they've been done for decades. There are still obviously film companies today that, you know, they have a back lot, I guess is the word that they call. They have a studio. They have a physical studio. But essentially films, all films these days, are basically independent productions is really what they are. I mean, I think the, even in the record business, I mean, I think that's the way it's been now for a long time, too, where essentially it, they're distributors. That's that's what they do. You know, yes, they have A&R people and they have other other ways that they're more than just that. But I think that that is just kind of the way it is. So United Artists was it made sense that they were. The film company that was that would sign up the Beatles, and I think I talk about this again. I don't want to, you know, repeat myself too much here. I talk about this in the book. I get into depth about United Artists film soundtrack division, you know, on on who they were and what they were looking to do. They were very much getting into, you know, audiophile stuff, and you know, they were really it was important to them. It wasn't just like a soundtrack was an after effect 
to United Artists. They knew that this could be this could be lucrative. Soundtracks were big sellers at the time. I mean, all you got to do is look at the Billboard charts in the 50s and the 60s. Some of the biggest selling albums of the time came from the West Side Stories and Mary Poppins and The Sound of Music and all that, all those albums. Uh, exactly. People would be surprised to know how well those albums did. Um, one thing that I have to commend you for is that you did a ton of research on every participant <laughs> in the Beatles films. Every cameraman, the director, <laughs> co-directors, you know, uh, you know, it's incredible all the information that you have packed as to what they did prior to working with the Beatles and after the Beatles. And you'll find a lot of similarities there, like with Richard Lester, he used some of the same actors in his films, for example. So for anyone that really wants to know and study, you know. What did Norman Rossington do before A Hard Day's Night or something like that? You can find that in this book. And even if a lot of this is on the internet, it took a ton of work for you to do all this. Yes. <laughs> I mean, I just felt like, you know, part of my sort of, I think my thesis going in in my mind was that it wasn't just about the Beatles or in the case of the first two films, Richard Lester that there were all of these incredible people involved in making these films, whether it was the cast or the people behind the scenes. You know, it was really important. And I thought it was important to point out, too, that some of them had already had in careers going in film, you know, really great careers, and that some of them would go on to have extraordinarily long careers. And, you know, I talk about how, there's so many people who worked on the Beatle films who worked on the Bond films at the time in England. United Artists was the company that distributed the Bond films. Mm -hmm. um, some of these folks would go on to have really long careers and work on the Harry Potter films, work on the Lord of the Rings films. You know, So it wasn't just the sense that the Beatles and, and Richard Lester in the beginning just made these films in a vacuum and they just happen to be, you know, wonderful movies. And especially as you move on, uh, the people behind the scenes become even more important, particularly Yellow Submarine. I mean, the Beatles really have nothing to do with Yellow Submarine other than supplying for songs and doing that little, you know, that little cameo at the end. I mean, it's, an, it's extraordinary the effort that went into making Yellow Submarine and what an important film it is as a, animated film for adults and i i get in the book as you know i give a lot of credit to dr bob hieronymus and his books on yellow submarine i mean those books there are two of them now um those books really are the, that's the definitive um text or texts on yellow submarine and i mean i think i kind of you know mirrored a little bit what he did in those books in that he he wanted to make sure that the people behind the scenes were given their due. I mean, he interviewed everybody connected with Yellow Submarine over the two books. I mean, it's extraordinary. He was very much involved in the you know the fiftieth anniversary, I think it was, of Yellow Submarine and the restorations. I mean, he really goes into into great depth. So I really just wanted to give the due, and I wanted to point out that this was an important time. In British cinema, when British cinema is really exploding, and I talk about how Hollywood was always ground zero for cinema in the world, the most important films, the most popular films. Um, and then after World War II, you definitely have a, a sort of um, explosion of films coming out of France, out of Italy, I guess, you know, other countries too, to some degree. But Britain had always kind of been in the background a little bit. There always had been good British films here and there, but they were never as important or popular for the most part as American films or then films from France, from Italy, you know, the sort of the French new wave, you know, so I wanted to make, make it clear that this time, this sixties time in England is just an explosion of incredible films, incredible directors. I mean, the actors that are, are coming onto the scene in the 60s. You know, Richard Burton, Peter Sellers, 
Peter O'Toole, you know, Julie Christie. I mean, I could, you know, I could go on and on. I could just name names here for the next 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's extremely important. And I wanted to just make it clear to people that, you know, the, the Beatles are part of this, but they're also, they're also being influenced by it. the influences going back and forth. It's a youth explosion too, is what it is, is films being made for baby boomers. These intelligent, educated people who are living, you know, a, a different life. It's, you know, new modes of expression, new modes of living. Uh, the sixties is a, is a cultural Renaissance, a personal and, you know, global Renaissance and, and London becomes, you know, sort of, you know, where it really, in many ways, it takes off in London, you know, not really Liverpool so much as London. And then it kind of moves, you know, to San Francisco. And, and then it kind of, it's kind of, it comes, you know, it's kind of everywhere almost in the 70s. Mm. It becomes a popular thing that reaches out to everybody. Yeah. I want to ask you one thing um, regarding A Hard Day's Night which I, I don't think you elaborated on. And I found this to be news to me that George Martin and Richard Lester had problems with the scoring that George Martin did, the instrumentals for A Hard Day's Night. What more can you tell us about that? Well, I just, it was, it was really what it was, was Lester wasn't happy with George Martin, if you can imagine that, okay? He just was not happy with him. And, you know, Richard Lester is a filmmaker, but he's also a musician. He's a he's a jazz pianist. I mean, he is a he's a very smart guy. He went to UPenn. Uh, he's he's one of these, you know, guys who was, you know, just very precocious. And he decided he didn't like what George Martin did for A Hard Day's Night. He didn't like what he was doing and they did not get along. Now, everybody who knows about George Martin knows what a gentleman he is and how easy he is to get along with. I think this was a question of Richard Lester, uh, you know, for whatever reason, you know, uh, I'm the director, I'm in charge, you know, I'm the numero uno. Uh, what he didn't like about it, I don't know specifically, he just didn't, he just he didn't care for it. And that's why he brought in Ken Thorne uh, to, to score help. Uh, and Ken was a guy who was around who had, already been in film and would continue to have a career in film. Martin was obviously still involved with the soundtrack of help, but um, he wasn't as involved uh, as, as a hard day's night simply because the two didn't get along. And I'm sure that George Martin was probably fine. You know, I, I don't really want to work with you anyway. I mean, I mean, we all know about George Martin. You don't really hear too many stories of people not getting along with George Martin. You know, I mean, he's just, one of these guys, he's a true gentleman. And I mean, I'm sure there are people that for whatever reason he didn't get along with, but I'm going to guess it wasn't because of George's behavior or lack of professionalism. It was because somebody decided, well, I'm, you know, I know better, you know? So, uh, but yeah, that's what happened. Interesting. Okay. All right. Why don't I pass you over to Alan? I wonder if the um, if the Beatles would have had any. Um, did, do you know if they made any attempt to get George Martin to do the scoring for the for Help? Did they did they weigh you know, in on that? I I, don't, I really don't think so. I think that you know, as you know, the the Beatles once they got to a certain point in their career, you know, let's say let's say Rubber Soul, you know, they started really like they want to be involved in everything, mm -hmm. and obviously with. You know, Revolver, that was the last time they were going to allow Capital to, to take apart, you know, their album the way they envisioned it. But, but they did, in a lot of respects, are, were willing to let other people do things. I mean, in the studio with engineering and producing, you know, banding, sequencing, um, you know, mixing. I mean, they did kind of leave it to the folks at EMI, Abbey Road, you know, they did do that. And in terms of filmmaking, I mean, they weren't filmmakers. They didn't try to direct the first couple of films. They didn't try to write the first couple of films. I mean, they really just kind of showed up. They really were, it was in, in many respects, it was somewhat out of character, but at that time 
it, it really kind of was in character for them. That's, you know, they let Brian was the manager. Brian booked the tours. I mean, you know, in the studio, when it came to, you know, writing and recording, they were from the very beginning, you know, they were in charge to a degree where they trusted George Martin and George worked well with them. They had a good relationship. They trusted him. But of course, even that, went on once we got to the white album say there was a lot of friction and you know i mean during the white album i mean i think everybody quit you know at some point you know either you know physically or spiritually or mentally you know at, during that period i mean that was the whole thing would let it be i mean john lennon the famous quote he said you know we're gonna we're not gonna do this your way with all your muckety muck production or whatever that whatever Lennon said you know which I'm sure he regretted uh, I know Paul definitely re regretted th that you know that was the case and yeah I don't think he begged George to do Abbey Road but I'm but I'm, there was a certain sense of you know we're sorry we didn't use you and mm -hmm. we're sorry if there was anything said you know that was you know not right mm -hmm. so um I mean, that's 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 kind of how it happened, because the funny thing is actually not that long after help is when George Martin sort of left EMI and started air and the Beatles then had a choice. You know, do we do we want to be assigned a new producer by EMI or are we going to force EMI to hire George Martin as a freelance producer to come in and produce us? And and that's what they did. Um so, you know, I guess uh, I guess maybe they maybe that wasn't the muscle they were willing to flex in terms of um, soundtrack music, because for them, it wasn't their music. It was just the orchestral stuff and um, probably didn't realize that half of the Capitol album. <laughs> and and there's a, that's another question in a way. Why? Why was the Help album as a soundtrack album on Capitol, not U.A.? I, I think what happened is at that point, I think Capital did sort of flex their muscles mm. and basically said, you know, this is this is not how this is going to happen, <laughs> you know. And just to kind of go back to what you said too, just to kind of clarify it a little bit, you know, I think there was a sense with Help too that the Beatles were really checked out with Help. I mean, they were much more there and present with a Hard Day's Night. Right. So whether George Martin is involved at all with the soundtrack. They're kind of like, they don't really care. I don't think at all. And I think that they had a really great relationship with George. And just because now George is not a, uh, you know, not on staff with EMI, they still wanted to continue to work with him. It was going well. They were happy with him. I mean, they had a really good relationship, you know, both in terms of how it worked musically, but I think how it worked in terms of they, they had a, a good personal relationship with him. I think they all liked him. And I think they felt that, you know, that he would do for them what they wanted to. I think there was that sense of, you know, where, you know, if John wanted to do something crazy, you know, George Martin would be like, fine, we'll we'll make it work. You know, and a, a lot of that became also the engineers, too, particularly Emmerich, you know, in, in terms of what he did. Mm -hmm. So, um I, I really think that that's that's really what it was. It's interesting you asked the question the way that you did, where you where you the, the, the sort of sequencing of it. I mean, George Martin's whole thing obviously was he was just tired of being ripped off by EMI, which is the, what it was. Yeah, and so he went off and and started Air, you know, with other people too. It wasn't just him, obviously. I think it was him and two other people, I believe. At least. Um... You know, it's it's also very possible that that they that they discussed it with George Martin, and and because he had such a bad experience with Lester on Hard Day's Night, he just said, "Forget it, leave it. I don't care." You know, we'll never know <laughs> unless we run into yeah. correspondence one day. Uh, <laughs> but um, um, you quote uh, John talking about how they felt like extras in help. And, and, and we know that he had said that a lot and, uh, and you know, that they were getting high a lot of the time. They weren't 
personally invested in help in in the same way they were hard days night and um i get the feeling in in a certain way that it was okay you know with a hard days night yeah we're gonna make a film that'll be fun let's do it we're into it and then it was okay been there done that you know and by the yes. time it got to what should have been the third one which uh you know you we were talking i found it interesting what you were saying before about how ua felt okay you know they want to do three you know maybe they will maybe they won't but by the time hard day's night and help were done i would think that ua really wanted the third film and the beatles were very reluctant you know um what about, you know, that whole period of, you know, reading scripts and saying, no, we don't want to. And then Paul meeting with Joe Wharton and Joe Wharton putting together this script and it not happening. Uh, um, how important a part of the film history is that, do you think? I mean, it's important. I mean, films take a long time and they're very collaborative. And it costs money. Mm -hmm. So I think there was a sense of, they're hearing these ideas, but they're not really, they're not really getting to a point where they're green lighting them. Right. You know, there's really a sense of, you know, or they're just not right. And they were never going to make that Joe Orton script. That was never going to happen. That was too far out, even for the Beatles at the time, <laughs> it was just not happening, you uh -huh. know? So there was a lot of false starts. And I think they, as the false starts piled up and they got more involved in the studio making more complicated records making movies became really unimportant how happy do you think ua was to get let it be as the third film do you do you think was were, were there factions within ua saying no this you know we want a fiction film we want to we want something like the first two this is a documentary and it's kind of a dark documentary did, did, did you have any sense of um, of what their reaction was internally? I mean, at this point, you have a lot of different people who are now working at UA. You know, things have really changed a lot there. Mm. And I think that the, the, the record label there is, is, is a different sort of entity. But I think, you know, they, ha they could have had the soundtrack for Yellow Submarine. And they didn't want it. They turned it down. You know, I mean, there really wasn't a, a soundtrack for Magical Mystery Tour until Capitol decided to create a full album. So so that's the history of that. The person driving Let It Be as a soundtrack album to come out on United Artists is Alan Klein. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the United Artists is not calling up the Beatles every day saying, where's that third soundtrack? You know, it's Klein had negotiated the new deal and he just wants to get product out. You know, this let it be movie and all these songs are sitting on a shelf. Let's get this out there. Let's make some money. I mean, that's, that's what the quote unquote, Hey Jude album is all about. As soon as the deal was struck, how do we make some money here? And so, okay, let's get some B sides together and let's just push this thing out there and let's just make some money. I mean, that's all that was. That's Klein driving that. He wasn't the one who handled the day-to-day -day of the actual work that goes into, you know, doing something like that. But that's what it was all about. Now, Klein knew there's, you know, there's a movie here. You know, don't forget too. And I, and I talk about this again in the book that Klein had already been uh, making inroads in the film business he had also he had already been producing films mm -hmm. he, he already he was insinuating himself at mgm right which eventually would merge with ua mm -hmm. so you know he, he was a guy who he's about money he's about making money and he knew that you know well this rock music thing again here we go with people saying this thing's not going to last forever he figured I can make more money being involved with movies than I can with making records. And I don't have to deal with these crazy rock stars, you know, doing it. I could go, I can be involved with filmmakers and film companies yeah. and I could be producer and I can get percentages on these things. And, you know, that's, that's what he saw. And so make, this is, this is part of it. Notably more stable than. than well, <laughs> 
anybody's more stable than 60s rock stars. Okay. 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 <laughs> Especially rich, famous ones who were doing a lot of drugs. Okay. Okay. I mean, Klein's an older guy. I right. think he feels more comfortable negotiating with film people, with sitting down across the table with a film director or a film producer or a film studio executive. Hmm. You know, it, it's he's talking more his language. You know, rock music at that time is this extremely abstract free for all. You know, it's the Wild West in, in, at this point, you know, in the late 60s and the early 70s. It's probably the once the Beatles make Sgt. Pepper, I think it's just it's anything goes in, in rock music uh, until, you know, until punk comes along, you know. So I think he he want, and I think he also felt like it was more prestigious to be involved in movies, to be involved in film than being involved in rock and roll. You know, I mean, think of all, all the hassles he's going through dealing with just the Beatles, dealing with Paul. You know, dealing with, you know, keeping John and Yoko happy and, you know, George Harrison. And, you know, I, I just think he that this is he saw the future. You know, I think once Easy Rider hit in 68, I think anybody that had a clue said, OK, so all of these kids who are buying all these rock albums, they're going to go to these movies now and we can make even more money, you know, on movies and it's it's glamorous. It's you know it's Hollywood. It's it's beautiful actresses, and it's you know anybody would want to be involved with the film business. And I think Klein he saw that. He also wanted to make money. That's where we start here. He's got this new deal. He wants to get product out. The Beatles are breaking up. He he wants to he wants to get product out. He can fulfill this this contract. This there's this third film soundtrack out there. You know. And even though it says Apple on it, it was United Artists. You know, even though that Apple is there, green or red, whichever one you bought, yeah. you know, uh, that that's that's what it was. And yeah. um, and and I, and I and I get into these films that he was involved with, um, and and how there's a crossover with, you know, the Apple company. Right. You know, uh, some of these films are coming out through Apple. You know which is Klein. Klein is in charge of Apple. So it's all, it's all very complicated, but it's all very calculated at the same time when it's, when it's Alan Klein. Yeah. I think Apple's film division is um, usually just sort of skipped over as, you know, and they did actually, as you say, do films. I mean, when, when, when I was uh, a kid, we used to go, my friends and I used to go see El Topo once a week. You yeah. Know? <laughs> Uh, I think that probably wasn't good for us. But. <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't think so. I remember seeing that at the the, the midnight movie. That's where you, that's where you saw that. Now, right. when I saw it at the time, we don't know it's Apple Films, the Beatles. You know, we're just we're just teenagers going to the midnight movie. Yeah. You know, on Friday night. Yeah. You know, but there's a lot of films that they make, and I talk about this in the book, and I mentioned some of them, and you know, the 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 film about you know. Uh, Ravi Shankar, Raga, Raga, you know, is, you know, is it still a kind of a significant, you know, film? Um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of, there's a lot of movies that come out through, through Apple. There's soundtracks that are, that they put out, that they came out through Apple. Um, you know, they, they wanted to be in film. I mean, film was a thing. It was another creative outlet. And I think it was also, I think, I think John in particular, saw film as a way to reach people, you know, get his message out, you know, his political, social messages. It's an, it's records is one way, you know, and I think there were, I think that John in particular saw records, there was a limitation to getting the message out with records where a film could, could be more effective in terms of broadening the message, getting mm -hmm. more into detail with the message and and reaching people who didn't necessarily buy Beatle albums or buy rock music albums or singles mm -hmm. or, or whatever the case may be, eight tracks if they were eight tracks were just coming out at the time. Um couldn't help notice that you mentioned our interview with um Peter Jackson in the book. In, in I had to. <laughs> um 
And uh, I was sort of wondering if, you know, when you, you started this book before Get Back came out, um, and I, I'm wondering, you know, just how, uh, you know, as a writer in the throes of a book about the Beatles films, how the experience of seeing Get Back changed your view of Let It Be. Yeah. Yep. I mean, you know, I'll answer this two ways. Is One is when I did my Let It Be book and I did my research, I found out that let it be was not all gloom and doom that there was a lot of fun that was had there was a lot of great music that was made so i didn't my view then had already changed through my research through interviewing people through doing research that it wasn't just this sort of film that everybody perceived it and part of the perception too was it came out after the beatles had broken up so that was sort of the the sort of you know prism through you know, what people looked through when they looked at the film, you know, and the way it was edited, this, you know, it's very dark, black, you know, uh, a lot of dark colors and, you know, just the whole way that the end of the Beatles was sort of written, you know, the whole sort of let it be was just everybody raked it over the coals, the critics, whether it was the album or the film. So th through doing my research, when the let it be book came out, I knew that this was different. So when I heard about get back, there was a part of me that was, well, I hope they're not just going to whitewash this. I hope there because there is a lot of bad blood here. This is a group breaking up. It's not the breakup, but it's part of the breakup that was filmed for the whole world to see. The breakup had been coming long before, as, as you all know, had been coming long before the Beatles started working on Get Back. I mean, they were breaking up during the White Album, they were probably breaking up before the White Album, okay? So I was concerned that there, it, it could be done as a whitewash job, but I think it was more of a, maybe giving more information so then it isn't just let it be or that period isn't just perceived as the end of the Beatles and the breakup and they hated each other's guts. You know, I think there was a sense of making more out of it but I don't think anybody ever knew that this thing was going to become an eight hour, you know, two hours a night special, you know, on the Disney channel over Thanksgiving weekend w when they initially decided to do it. This was Peter Jackson who just kept finding all this material and just kept adding more and more to it. And then because of the delays with COVID, it was like, he was like a kid in a candy store, you know? Yeah. And I mean, there really was a sense at the end that I don't think Disney knew what they were getting. I mean, if, if I remember now, I don't know if it was in yeah. the, inter I think with the interviews that you, you guys did yeah. where he sort of, not that he was, you know, pulling a fast one on them or pulling the wool over their eyes, mm -hmm. but I mean, you know, filmmakers and authors like me, <laughs> we go <laughs> on and on and on and on. You don't want to leave anything out. The manuscript of this book, if they printed it, as I delivered it to them, the book wouldn't have been 350 pages. It would have been 500 pages, just so you know. Okay. So there's a certain amount of this book that was left on the cutting room floor, you know, so which is what happens with movies and, and books. And, you know, that's just the way it is. But because he was Peter Jackson and because of the fact that this thing was going to originally debut, eventually that was what they were going to do is debut it on television as a series, well, we don't have to. It, it's we don't have to do it as a movie. It doesn't have to be two or two and a half hours or an hour and a half shown in the movie theater. So it becomes a, a series, and this is when all of this streaming stuff is taking off. I mean, this it already had been happening, you know, with Netflix, with the, all these series on Netflix, and all these filmmakers gravitating towards wanting to do more of these sort of long form things and people would watch them at home. And I mean, this stuff has been going on since HBO started with the Sopranos and even before that. So some of it is not new, right. but I originally it was going to be a film. It wasn't going to be a, it wasn't going to be a series. And, and I try to detail this. I try to give the history of the evolution of get back mm -hmm. the, the television series to show kind of how it evolved you know it's funny i mean the beatles are making 
Magical Mystery Tour. And they didn't say, oh, yeah, Magical Mystery Tour. We're going to make this film Magical Mystery Tour, and it's going to be a 45-minute TV show. Th that's not what they set out to do in the beginning. So it's interesting how how that kind of there was kind of like lightning struck again, sort of, so to speak. Since you mentioned that that's not what they intended when they started making Magical Mystery Tour, I thought that perhaps for people who haven't read the book yet, what what they did intend, what their vision of Magical Mystery Tour was when they started it, as opposed to the forty five minute TV show that it ended up as. I mean, I don't think they had a, a specific vision of the length of it, but I mean, I think they were set out to make a movie that would be shown in movie theaters, not a television show. So, and, you know, and I, 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 I replicate this to some degree in the book, the sort of pie chart that McCartney creates on the airplane ride back from, from California, I, I believe it is. I mean, that was the script, essentially. That was the shooting script or the outline, I mean, you know, of this is what we're going to do. And we're going to just kind of, and, and I, I go into all kinds of detail about how McCartney uh, was very influenced by, you know, the avant-garde films that were going on at the time. And I talk about, you know, sort of what's going on in the sort of underground film, avant-garde film. I mentioned very specific films, very specific names, directors, you know, a lot of different people. And as we all know, you know, McCartney was very sort of plugged in to not just what was going on in music, but what was going on in movies and theater and art and books. And, you know, he was a, he was a real magpie. I mean, he really was interested in everything and he wanted to try things. He was very, you know, ambitious and creative. And, and so I think there was a sense that they had seen some of these avant-garde underground films. And I think that they felt like, well, you know, we can kind of do something like this, but just like with Sergeant Pepper, it was, it was also ground in some very old fashioned ideas where Sergeant Pepper used, you know, a lot of old time music, jazz, or, you know, whatever, you know, different music from the past and some, some, some ideas from the past, you know, they also, you know, the whole idea of in England, they go on these coach trips, these family coach trips, you get on a bus and you go to the seaside and, you know, you have fun and you sing along on the bus and all of that. I mean, th that's not avant-garde filmmaking. That's very much, you know, grounded in old British culture. So again, you know, I, this is another reason why I feel, you know, the, the two projects, Sergeant Pepper and Magical Mystery Tour, they're very much, they're a part of each other because they're very psychedelic, obviously. They're very avant-garde. They're very out there, but they're also using particularly McCartney using, you know, musical motifs or musical genres very much from the past and very much rooted in sort of British culture. The whole idea of getting the family around the piano on Sunday afternoon and singing along or, you know, singing along in the pub and all of that. And I think John, you know, with, the, for the benefit of Mr. Kite, you know, using this old, this old circus poster, I mean, is it, it's, you know, it's an old thing. It's an old timey kind of thing. And I, I, that's what, you know, it's, I think that's what makes, you know, Sergeant Pepper, especially in Magical Mystery Tour, even to some degree, you know, long lasting, because it isn't just all this kind of period psychedelic freak out. You know what I'm saying? There is a lot of it is very much rooted in, you know, uh, you know, musical forms that had been around, you know, dance hall, jazz, Great American Songbook. You know, I mean, look, it's so obvious to state that John and Paul are such great songwriters because they grew up with all of this tradition. You know, they'd heard so much great songwriting growing up, you know, in, in Liverpool. So, um, you know, I, I think that's very much what it was. It just kind of evolved. Uh, as far as the film itself, I mean, they had a lot of help in editing the film, not to make a joke here, in, in terms of editing the film and shaping it into something that wasn't just a complete, you know, you know, hour and a half freak out. And that made it might have been part of the reason why it eventually became only 45 minutes. I mean, I look at Magical Mystery Tour 2 very much as sort of the Beatles were already making these sort of promotional clips, which would, you know, in the MTV age would be called videos. So they were already doing this sort of thing, you know, whether they had any kind of input into it or not, 
they were already doing this. So Magical Mystery Tour, in some respects, becomes a collection of promotional clips, videos, these set pieces. And does it all hang together perfectly? No, definitely not. It, it is kind of sort of all over the place. And what at the end, you know, kind of what does it mean? <laughs> you know, I mean, I've watched it many times. I don't know, you know, but sometimes it's like, you know, there's people that say, you know, 2001, A Space Odyssey, you know, a Stanley Kubrick's film. It, does it really make any sense? Like, right. what is yep. the story? What is the real, can, can anybody really explain what it means. I don't think Kubrick ever really explained what it means. And I think part of that too becomes, you know, we all like everything so neatly tied together and the movie has to end. We, everybody gets it and it's a happy ending and all that. Well, life isn't like that. You know, life is messy and it doesn't always have happy endings and you catch people or people or people, you know, or, or different groups of people at different points in their life and their life doesn't end so you're showing a slice of it. And I think that, you know, that's what, you know, Magical Mystery Tour is in some ways. It gives you a kind of a slice of, of psychedelic. It's kind of Sergeant Pepper on film, which I think mm -hmm. is very much what Yellow Submarine is too. I mean, a lot of what Yellow Submarine is, is the filmmakers had an advanced copy of Sergeant Pepper and they were in the beginning. And that's what they were using as sort of the jumping off point to create the story. You know, the, the narrative of, of what it was, even though there, it isn't a, a very strict narrative also. Right. So and everybody always wants these sort of definitive answers. Here's what happened. This is exactly what happened. This is exactly what they meant. This mm -hmm. is this is why sometimes criticism leaves me a little cold because it becomes one person's opinion. Now, if something is obvious and the songwriter or the musician or the filmmaker says, yes, that was the intention. Okay, fine. But often, particularly in this period, this kind of psychedelic period where everybody's just, you know, in freak out mode, uh, there, there is a lot that is, it isn't defined, or there are several sort of, you know, um, meanings you could derive from it, or different people bring different their, their own conclusions to it, you know, right or wrong conclusions. Mm -hmm. um, I would just observe that it's interesting that you um, say that they, uh, they they started thinking of it as a film to be seen in the theaters. Um, in the UK, of course, it was on TV, but for a lot of us, seeing it in theater was the first way we saw it, you know, usually at a, a late night screening on a campus or something like that in a really, really bad print. But anyway, yeah. I will hand you on to Darren. In a little piece of perfect editing, um, my first question was exactly what Alan just talked about. Uh, but uh, before we get to how the film debuted in the United States, it always struck me very odd that someone thought it was a good idea not that the film, the reviews would have been any better, but how did Magical Mystery Tour come about being broadcast in black and white first? Why was that done? And then a redo a few weeks later in color. I think at the time it was shown on the main BBC channel, which was in black and white, because that was the bigger audience. Okay. And they sold it to them. And they made a decision, the BBC, this is how we're going to show it. NBC, I believe, if I'm not mistaken, they were going to they were going to buy it and they turned it down. Now, at that time, if they had shown it in America, it would have been in color. It would have been shown in color, uh, probably on much bigger televisions, too, by the way. OK, if, at that time period, Americans, more Americans had bigger color televisions and more programming was being broadcast in color where england at the time was very much behind america in terms of television in terms of color in terms of the size of television screens it, it, it's that that's just how it was you know you know the, the 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 government had more control over television in england at the time the the new sort of non-commercial independent 
television networks were just emerging at this time, where in America, it was almost entirely commercial television, except for PBS. Mm -hmm. And it was more, you know, color entertainment type programming. So, you know, I'm sure that somebody must have looked at this thing and said, oh, here's this movie we're going to show on Boxing Day, which was another genius move on their part. But I guess they just figured, oh, it's the Beatles. Everybody will be home on Boxing Day watching television. We'll put the Beatles on. It'll be great. <laughs> you know, they had they had just made Sgt. Pepper. So they were at the top of the world. No one's going to question the Beatles at this point. You know, the Beatles were, I mean, they transcended everything after, after Sgt. Pepper. You know, more than Beatlemania. Sergeant Pepper was was a global cultural phenomenon. I don't I don't have to tell the the, the three of you that obviously. Mm-hmm. So, you know, obviously in retrospect, you know, it was it was a mistake, and the Beatles right. were raked over the coals. And yeah, it was when it was shown in color later on, there was a little bit more of a sense of understanding it and some better reviews. But still, you know, it's hard for us to understand what seeing something like that on television at that time in England would be like. I mean, first of all, we're all Americans. You know, we, we don't understand the culture, the cultural significance of Boxing Day. So it, it's it's hard to understand. We saw, like like Alan said, and I think Darren, you alluded to it too, we, we saw the film later in the 70s, you know, when it was when we were of a certain age and of a certain mindset i'll put it that way and we saw it on a big screen at midnight with our pals you know probably with el topo you know so it was just i mean i remember when i first saw it i was sort of like okay yeah what was that i don't remember i'm just going to admit this i don't remember being too particularly impressed with it but i also think that maybe i just wasn't that cool too (laughs) You know what I mean? Where it was like, you know, you know, I don't remember you. This is a long time ago, but right. you know, uh, you know, it's funny. I ran into a uh, 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 Bruce Spicer at the Chicago Fest, and he added some new information to when um, when it was first shown. I believe it was Magical Michelle when it was first shown in America. He had recently dug up some new information. You know, which is, you know, Bruce Spicer is that's why he's Bruce Spicer, you know. <laughs> so um, it, it's it's interesting how these things evolve when they're shown, when they're shown again, when different people see them. You know, like now I would imagine people see Magical Mystery Tour and it's like, oh, yeah, that's a weird movie. Or, oh, that looks like a bunch of videos or, oh, it's the Beatles. It's great. You know, or there's more of an understanding of it or the music so overwhelms whatever shortcomings there is with it as a film or a, or a television show. It's interesting, you know, how the length of the Magical Mystery Tour film is almost the same length as the original Ruddles movie, you know? <laughs> I mean, there's your perfect double bill, you know? <laughs> and which one is funnier, you know, depending on what frame of mind you're in, you know? <laughs> I don't know if this is factual or not, just off the top of my head. But was a magical mystery tour? I think like might have been shown at the Fillmore. I don't know, East or West or something like that. That was the first time in the U.S. Well, I, I, I don't know if it was the first time because, like I said, Bruce Spicer has come up with some new information. Okay, only or I don't know how recent, but at least since I wrote the book and delivered the manuscript, you know. So um, I think yeah, that was that was one of the first places that it was shown. And I mean, that, that makes sense. Mm -hmm. You know, the film was under a cloud. There was no question about it, not to make a joke here. It was very much under a cloud of like, Oh yeah, that kind of sucked. Or like the Beatles even themselves were sort of like, yeah, you know what? Let's just forget that. We're just, we're moving on now to the next thing. I mean, they were not used to criticism at that point. I mean, that was really the first sort of project where people sort of said, hey, you know, that really wasn't very good. You know, they had kind of done no wrong, really. I mean, other than what, you know, John's whole bigger than Jesus thing or bigger than Rod, as the Ruddles put it, you know, you know, that was the only real false step 
that they had really had up until that point. So Magical Mystery Tour becomes this kind of, it's kind of a big deal that suddenly, you know, up oh, the Beatles, they're not perfect, mm-hmm. you know. So, you know, they they were not happy about it, especially Paul. I mean, he was the driving force, you know. You know, it's funny. I um, I interviewed this guy, Michael Saracen, for the book, who was one of the, one of the uh, camera people on, magical mystery tour and as somebody who worked in film he loved the experience and i and i and I, I quote him in the book he loved the idea of working in this very sort of loose way he had he had worked so much on very structured kind of films where there isn't a lot of room to be creative and he really enjoyed working on magical mystery tour and he really and he really kind of he really dug where Paul was coming from in terms of what Paul was trying to do and Paul's kind of method in terms of it. He really liked it. He had a really good experience. He was really very happy with it. So just to give you, again, you know, there's all of these points of view. You know, I think what happens is over the years, there becomes this kind of the weight of critical mass about an album or a film or a tour or an, you know, a, a, an artist of some kind. And it becomes like gospel. It becomes like, you know, what everybody, you know, says, you know, there's this, there's factions too. There's, and, and different people have written about this already. This is not news. You know, there's the people who are the Paul people. There's the people who are the John people, you know, and, and so depending on the, the, the song or the project or the album or the film, there's different people bring certain preconceived notions to things. I really tried to not do that. I really tried to be a journalist. I really wanted to just be like, uh, like a reporter. And I know some people, they, they don't like that. It becomes a little dry for them. They want it to be, they want fireworks. They want you to say, yeah, you know, Paul is this, or John was that, or Ringo did this thing, or Brian, or I'm not interested in that stuff. You know, I mean, I, I, I'll say certain things because when it's when it's significant, but I, I didn't want to write a, you know, here's my opinion of the whole thing. Right. You know, five movies, you know, I mean, it's it's five new five movies that they made and X amount of soundtrack albums, which is almost half of their output as a recording group. You know, obviously, Yellow Submarine is only four is only four songs, you know, so. I, I always like to just kind of like do the research, you know, I, I wish I could have talked to more people who were there, but at this stage of the game, unfortunately, especially with the first two films, you know, a lot of these folks, they're not with us anymore, or they're, they just, they, they don't want to talk anymore. They feel that they, they, they they can't, they don't remember things as well. And they don't, they don't want to talk. Obviously I didn't interview Paul or Ringo, you know, when I did the Let It Be book, I talked to a lot more people because at the time there was a lot more people around to talk to. It was a lot easier, you know, and I was, you know, I was focused on, on, on the last one of the last things they did. So it was a bit fresher, too, in people's minds. Um, my last question before we uh, go to Ken one more time <clears throat> In your opinion, if Brian Epstein hadn't died, would Magical Mystery Tour have happened? And if it was going to happen, would it have been any different than what the finished product was? I don't think it would have necessarily have been dramatically different, but it it would have been different. But I think what Brian would have done is he would have been the guy to take care of the coach the logistics, the hotel rooms, the shipping equipment, uh, to organizing people, uh, to doing things with budgets. Um, it, maybe it would have been maybe a little bit more linear. Maybe it would have been a little longer. Maybe they would have worked on it a little more because they would have had less uh, responsibility for some of the things that they normally wouldn't have in the past because Brian would have taken care of it. At this point, obviously Neil and Mal are taking care of a certain amount of this stuff. You know, Neil of course will emerge, you know, at the guy who will eventually run Apple, you know, but you know, th- this is right on the heels of Brian passing away. You know, yeah. that that this project, 
you know, is happening. It, it would have happened. And again, I don't think it would have necessarily been dramatically different. I mean, who knows? Maybe they make it and they show it to Brian and Brian begs them. Don't put this out is people are not going to understand it. People are not ready for it. Um, and who knows, maybe that's the last straw and they say, well, we're going to put it out and you know what, Brian, you're fired. You know, I mean, cause that's all the talk of this period too. Will Brian continue on as the group's manager, you know, cause this is the time period that his contract is coming due. I think he would have remained as their manager, but I think his role would have, would have changed. His role had already changed because the main thing that he did was to get them a recording contract and then all the sort of radio appearances, television appearances, live appearances, touring, all that. That was that was what Brian mostly did. His role had already diminished greatly, you know, by this point, you know. So um, so th- there's always all of these kind of what ifs, you know, what if this and what if that. Right. I mean... I think they would have continued to use him as their manager. I think they loved Brian, whatever the problems there were with Brian's, you know, with him and his personal life, whatever sort of bad deals were cut along the way. um, There was a real affection. They were the one, he was the man who believed in them, who got them a recording contract, who turned them into the biggest pop phenomenon in the world. I I think the, the Beatles were loyal. You know, I think they were, when you look at, you know, Neil and Mal's position, as you guys know, in the in the sort of history of the Beatles. I mean, you know, they were loyal. They were especially the people that started with them in Liverpool. I think part of that is a trust factor, too. You know, these are the people that were with us when we were nobodies. Anybody right. else that comes along is sees us as a meal ticket, sees us as the Beatles, these the the biggest pop entertainment phenomenon in the world who apparently have you know millions of dollars socked away in the bank somewhere you know Mm -hmm. all right well let's uh, continue our last go around the horn uh with uh ken okay i want to touch upon one thing where richard lester is concerned by the way did you ever try to interview richard i know he's now early 90s god bless him yeah, um, I, I I was able to get an updated email from somebody, I believe, along the way that I believe was an updated e- email, but I never I never did hear anything. And a- according to the research that I did, he hasn't really done anything in a really long time. And what I did is I, I don't know where in the book this is. I believe it's it, I don't think it's near the end, but I forget exactly where it is. I found an interview, and I think I, I, I think I got some help from the folks at the Criterion Collection. I think they helped me with this. There was an interview that he did with at an Italian film festival, um, and they were able to help me with an with an interview that was translated. Um, and that was a number of years ago, and that was from what I can see was the last interview that he ha- he has done. He's still alive. That was the last interview that he had done, and that was quite a number of years ago. I don't remember the exact date, but in the book, um, I, I'm, I'm very specific in terms of where the interview was done, who did it, what year it was, what month, it, you know, everything about it. It's on the, I believe I found it on the internet too, to back up, you know, what I received from the, from the company. So, um, but, you know, it would have been great. To, to, mm. to have some new fresh quotes from Richard. You know, if I had done this book, you know, a number of years ago, whatever, X amount of years ago, I'm sure he would have done it. He seemed to be the kind of person that if people were interested, he was, he had an extraordinary career. So, you know, um, he, he, he was, a, he was really an important filmmaker in the sixties and the whole sort of view of it. And then his career kind of, I talk about why his career kind of ends. Mm. Um, you know, I get into that, which I think I, I'm not going to get into that here. Um, but um, he he is he is super significant to the story of the Beatles on film. 
There's an, and in an, film of the '60s in general, and 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 he is also another American living in England who becomes a significant part of the Beatles story, mm-hmm. and the and a significant part of uh, British film uh, history also. Well, which I also get into depth in the in the book. Mm-hmm. A few things that I found you know really interesting that he said uh, in particular that he really liked the editing process of films more so than actual filming itself because the filming part is the expensive part and there's a lot of waste involved but he really liked i guess it was more creative for him doing the editing um and he also said that he preferred help over a hard day's night yes he did um you know filmmakers always say this that films come together in the editing room you know i mean whether the director is involved with that process or not and yeah i think i i think the reason why he liked help more was he had more time to work on it he had a bigger budget it was in color he had he had more you know big time actors to work with um he was really happy with the he felt that the cinematographer uh what he did with color film cinematography and help was he felt was a breakthrough at the time Mm. so he felt it was significant so i think he's saying that because of the people around him and because he, you know, he had the success of a hard day's night. So the pressure is kind of off too, where, okay, I can go and I can, I'm free to kind of do what I want here. It's more of a, of a movie movie than, Mm -hmm. than a hard day's night is a hard day's night is almost like Lester creating a certain kind of filmmaking, you know, on the fly. And, you know, he talked about how he, didn't like the train sequence in a hard day's night because that was in the beginning of the film and the Beatles were still learning how to be actors at that point. And just logistically, I think, you know, making a movie that was more, you know, you know, um, on location in London dealing with crazy fans and, you know, the, 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 they had, they didn't have as much time to make the film, and Lester was a, just a much more um, experienced filmmaker. He made a movie between A Hard Day's Night and Hell, which is, it, it's, it's hard to believe, um, mm-hmm. which won the Palme d'Or at Cannes, the first British movie to win it in decades, by the way. So, um, you know, you can see why, even though I think anybody would agree A Hard Day's Night is a better film, why um, Lester felt, help for him was more of an enjoyable experience and a better film, I guess, in his mind. Well, go figure. I've always liked help the most myself. And actually I saw help before a hard day's night. And I saw it in the the movie theater and just to see the Beatles in color was mesmerizing. In the cola. Yeah. You know, I love it too. And I, I'm a big fan of British spy movies of the sixties. So You got me. <laughs> so, I, you know, that's part of the reason why help is it's just fun. And it, it's 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 almost like you're watching Austin Powers, you know, before Austin Powers. You know, it's like it's just great. It, it just, you know, I, you know, I, I've heard this and I'd like to if you don't mind, I'd like to throw a, a question out to you folks hmm. is I've heard that uh, I did. a. By the way, I should say this. I, I did a screening here on um, a a, a art house theater in New York. And we showed, they showed a hard day's night and I did a Q and a afterwards. And I can't tell you how many people were like, so when are you going to show help? You know, how many people said this either that night or after the fact I've heard that. And the the Karsh family owns a hard day's night. And I interviewed uh, one of the members of the Karsh family for a hard day's night, but the Karsh family shares ownership with Apple and the Beatles with help. And I've heard that help is not really being shown because there's some sense of the issues, the politically incorrect issues um, with the film, which are, you know, kind of minor in in respects. I don't know. And and when I wrote the book, I don't remember if that was something that had come up or I knew about or that I investigated as thoroughly. I, I mean, I have my problems with some of the like, you know, here's the peace and love Beatles. And at the end, there's guns and tanks and all that. I, I think I point out that that's a little incongruous. But have you heard anything like that? Any of the three of you? Have you heard anything like that? I haven't. No. 
for sure. <laughs> okay. I have to think because I would love to see it on a big screen. And I mean, there was a lot of people that night that you know, when are you going to show help? And yeah, you should show help now. And I would love to see that. And when I saw a hard day's night, I mean, it was a beautifully restored black and white version, perfect print of the film. It looked beautiful and the music sounded fantastic. It was great to see it, you know, on a, on a big screen. I mean, not a multiplex size screen, but like a bit, a big full screen, you know, the whole idea of seeing the four of them enter the same apartment through separate doors early on is so absolutely brilliant, <laughs> you know, and I, the monkeys, <laughs> I'm sure that's where they got the whole monkeys house thing from, you know. <laughs> but um, I guess you interviewed Cameron Crowe because there's a there's a number of quotes in the book there, and I yes, it was a favorite moment for him of that film. But yeah, photography wise, uh, you know, skiing on the slopes of Austria, Buckingham Palace, Salisbury Plain. There's so much there; it's absolutely stunningly beautiful the way that it was shot. Yeah. So. But if you could, Steve, because to me, the most important thing when we're talking about the Beatles films, first of all, you couldn't find five more films that could be any different from each other. And that's part of the brilliance of, you know, the history of the Beatles on film. But we know that the Beatles enjoyed the experience of A Hard Day's Night. Although I've heard John complain that maybe the characters of the four of them weren't that accurately por portrayed. Um, but from one film to the next, was it kind of like what Alan said with help, that it was a been there, done that kind of an attitude? Did they enjoy the experience of help? Because you'd never know it from watching the film. Right, <laughs> that right. Or stoned, or I, I certainly never got that impression. And then Magical Mystery Tour. The pleasures Tour. of tea. <laughs> Magical Mystery Tour just something that they did because they had to do whatever was the next project. Would we have to keep moving on? Did they enjoy that experience? And uh, you know, and talk <coughs> submarine and let it be. Just what you know of what what the four Beatles impressions have been of those five films. Okay, I, I think I could do it succinctly. I mean, you know, it was exciting for them to make a film with a hard day's night. You know, it was a very exciting thing, and it was very successful. I think they, I think they were happy with it. I think, yeah, there was some sense, you know, after the fact that John felt that, well, that was kind of the cartoon version of who we were. That's not really who. I mean, that's John. You know, John's always going to. There is going to be something that John has an opinion about, you know, and it is going to make, you know, it's going to make something of it. But I think that they were happy about it. And then I think when it came to help, they were like, they were sort of, yeah, they were kind of checked out. They had done it. We made a movie. We're really, you know, we're really, you know, uh, we have too much going on. We're, we're making singles. We're making albums. We're making television appearances, radio appearances. We're touring. We're doing all of this stuff. You know, now we have to make a movie too. But I also think that they enjoyed kind of getting away from, in some respects, from Beatlemania and from all of that by going to these far flung places, particularly the Bahamas. I think they thoroughly enjoyed being in the Bahamas. I don't think there's any question about it. And it was like in the winter. So, you know, I don't think they had ever really been to a place like that where they could really spend any time, you know, growing up in you know, gray, dreary, wet England, and especially Liverpool, you know. So I think that part of it, they liked, you know, I'm sure it was a laugh for them, as they would say, you know, and they were having fun. I mean, they were the rich and famous, and they were doing whatever they wanted. And they were starting to kind of sprout their wings a little bit. And, and yes, they were heavily indulging in the pleasures of tea. I don't think there's any question about it, you know. And so that becomes part of the fun of it, too. And Richard Lester, I think, was easy on them. I don't think he, like said, you know, you guys have got to, like, be a little bit more on the ball here. <laughs> We're making a movie. So I think that he gave them a lot of rope, so to speak. <laughs> you know, not to make another dumb joke here. But, <laughs> you know, so I, I think that and then when it came out, they all went to the premiere. They all, you know, did whatever. Look, there, there's some great songs on the Help album. And in that period, that to me, that's some of their some of their best music, you know, the where 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 
it's it's after the early covers it's after the initial sort of a hard day's night and them finally doing a whole album of their own it's before things get too psychedelic this is a great period for them this period you know so there, there's some great music that they're obviously enjoying i mean this is the peak in some respects or the beginning of the peak of John and Paul still writing together where they're still very much, you know, sitting down together, writing songs where they are very much Lennon and McCartney collaborations. And, and so, I mean, it is, it's just a, it's a fun movie. It is just, it kind of captures this sort of, it's, it's, it's not quite mod London. I don't know if I would quite go that far because it's not a mod film. That the who or the kinks or the small faces would have made that movie, you know, but it is that kind of, you know, you know, post Beatlemania pre psychedelic that there is this, there is a, there is something very special about that period. If you think of the singles that they release, you know, sort of after, after a hard day's night, after Beatles for sale, you know, before, you know, before rubber soul, the singles that come out, just unbelievable music. I mean, they're at their, they are really at the height of their power, as songwriters, and and they're knocking these things out quickly at, at EMI too, and and getting great help from the people there with George Martin and whoever it is that is engineering these projects at the time too. So yeah. then, Ma- Magical Mystery Tour <laughs> is them. This is their film. This is what, you know, what Paul wants to do. And I think the other ones went along with it. John was getting involved in trying to write parts of it. And I think George was enjoying it. Now, I, I talk about this in the book. If you see pictures or like not um, not outtakes from the film, but like newsreels, they seem very relaxed. And there's all these fans around and they're signing autographs and they're very sort of blasé about it. They don't feel like, oh, it's Beatlemania and people are... They want autographs and they won't leave us alone. They're hounding us. They seem very relaxed. They seem like they're happy. It's almost a little bit like they're kind of on vacation. You know, Brian's not around anymore. So there is a sense that, you know, mother is not there anymore to kind of corral them and tell them what to do in some ways. They're very much feeling a sense of freedom and and feeling their oats, so to speak. You know, Yellow Submarine, they have nothing to do with, really. Now, once they saw what yellow submarine was going to be they were really interested and they thought oh this is actually going to be really good and they you know there was a sense of they wish they could have almost been a little bit more involved and that's why they filmed this kind of sequence at the end because they they did kind of want to kind of rubber stamp it you know and of course now here we always we end up here with let it be which is always kind of like you know it's like the end. You know, a friend of mine once, he was talking to me, but he's an avid reader. And he says, oh, yeah, I just finished the biography of whoever it was. And oh, yeah, and he dies at the end. <laughs> he was making a joke, but he was also making a point that, you know, all unfortunately, these stories come to an end, you know, and the Beatles come to an end. And it's still, you know, not a happy prospect all these years later that the Beatles broke up, you know. So it is, it is kind of, uh, you know, John hated, hated it. You know, I think, you know, George quit during the making of it, right. you know, uh, I, you know, get back. I don't think happens if George was still alive, you know, George was the main person that wanted to keep, um, keep it out of circulation, you know, let it be naked. You know, I, I think happens at a point where, you know, it's like, I think if George was, really involved i don't think he i don't think he would have wanted to see that project i i think again that's there's there's that's the first step of of sort of revisionism when it comes to get back let it be you know the original project whatever you want to call it Hmm. you know so uh it's still not over you know as far as i'm concerned i mean there's still you know they they put the audio for the rooftop concert out only on streaming they they haven't put it out on you know vinyl CD, Blu-ray, DVD or whatever they haven't invented yet. The the um, condensed version for the cinemas of the rooftop concert that was shown for a few weeks there has never come out on DVD or Blu-ray. It's not available on streaming. Um, there's 
you know, I think Peter Jackson would still like to 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 put out a, a, a director's cut. You know, I think the Blu-ray was really a d- disappointment to people that they really were expecting there to be extras on that. There should have been more. Uh, recently, there's been news. I'm sure you're all aware of it, where Michael Lindsay Hogg has said that he's done some interviews and they're supposed to be. Uh, a let it be coming out whether it's theatrically on dvd on blu-ray whatever the case may be uh alan uh do you have any final uh uh thoughts uh for steve regarding act naturally i was going to ask you know one final question that has two parts um first uh you know as an author facing a new project and the blank page um what did you find the biggest challenge about getting this project together? And then in doing it, what was the, were were there any, um, anything that really was surprising to you that you learned in the course of it? I mean, I think in general, the way that I work as a writer is like, you hear the expression writer's block, which I think is really something more that fiction writers have i don't know what writer's block is okay it's journalism it's research you work it's work you roll up your sleeves and you you know better than anybody mm-hmm. your extraordinary mccartney book the first volume you know better than anybody it's work that's what it is it's 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 shoe leather the disappointment is i wish i could interview more people who were there so it's 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 more first hand um, you know, uh, observations, less of um, taking material that's already been out there. Um, you know, that's always the thing. I love when it's, you know, more people who are there and not just the principals too. I think sometimes when you talk to people behind the scenes, I mean, I think there was a few surprises. I don't think there was anything that like really jumps out at me. Um, I mean, there's little things that kind of happen along the way that you kind of uncover sometimes there's like you could write where for days you're writing and you know pages and pages and there's a day you can get stuck on like a fact and you you stuck and you can't verify it or you want a second or third source and you don't want to just cut it out of the manuscript you feel it's important and so like i i had a few instances where i asked i reached out to people for you know, like Mark Lewison or Bruce Spicer or, um, you know, different people. I had uh, Bruce Spicer read. There was a part of Magical Mystery Tour that I was struggling with a little bit in terms of the chronology. It was only a few pages. I asked him if he would read it. Um, You know, it's work. It's, you know, it's just you want to get everything in. I think one of the problems we have as authors is, You know, we don't want to leave anything out. I mean, we think everything is significant. But I think that when you're talking about the Beatles, if you leave something out because of space, then it's easy for another Beatles expert. I shouldn't say another. I'm not a Beatles expert. For a Beatles expert to say, well, why didn't you say that? Or why did you leave that out? Or that was significant. Or And so I, so you don't want to leave things out because then it seems like, you, you haven't done your work or you're leaving things out that might be important, that gives even more meaning and more context. But unfortunately, publishing companies, they, they have a product to sell and, you know, it's harder to sell a longer book. It costs more money to produce a longer book. The, the longer a book is just logistically production wise to print pages and bind things and ship them, it costs more money. And you sell less books, you make less money. I understand it's a business, you know? So um, I think that because of COVID and the delay of the Get Back series, there was delays in my manuscript in terms of the deadline. And that was great because I kept getting more and more time because I really wanted to get it right. I really wanted to make sure it's all there. You know, it's, you know, I, I, I have tremendous respect for all the scholarship that comes before I, I, I make a lot of hay about this in the beginning of the book in terms of my sources and, you know, how all the other film books that have already come out books about the films of the Beatles and how I want people to go and read those books and, and check it out and read other things. My book is not a definitive source at all. You know, this is just the, this is my book that's out at this time. 
you know? So um, you really want a sense of, you know, that there's an album, there's probably a phrase, but there's an album by Oasis. It's called Standing on the Shoulders of Giants. And I think if you write a Beatles book, I think that's what you're doing because of the scholarship of people like Bruce Spicer and Mark Lewison and, and many others, Ken Womack, you know, uh, extraordinary books, the books that are um, very much, uh, you know, the, the, the timeline books, the chronology books, the books that are basically almost raw data, which are a lot of work. And, and those books are invaluable, you know, when you're doing this, you know, Mark Lewison's, uh, recording sessions book is obviously important, but uh, his his book the 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 the, um, the Beatles day to day and the and the second edition that he did of that the hardcover one that's the bigger one that is is I I I looked at those books every minute that I was writing th this book and made it very clear in the introduction that I did. I mean, I think all of us aspire, but I definitely don't reach the kind of work that Mark has done and Bruce. And I have to say, Alan, I'm not just saying this, but what you've done with the first volume of your McCartney uh, biography, this is going to be the definitive McCartney biography. I don't think there's any question about it. I'm not the first person that said that either. <laughs> you know? <Thank> you. <laughs> yeah. Well, I want to thank you, Steve, for the time that you gave us today. Very generous uh, that you gave us thank this you. much time. And congratulations on the new book. Please, let's, I don't know how many years in between uh, Let It Be and this one, uh, but. 19 yeah, years, that's if you can believe we, it. We need a new book yeah. sooner. So when we're done here, hey, I don't promise know. me you're going to get right to work on the next book. <laughs> uh, actually, you know, life is what what happens while you're busy making other plans. What did John, how did John put it? I mean, um, there's been some false starts, some, some other ideas that didn't happen. Yeah, <laughs> another book is what happens when you're, never mind, I was going to make a bad joke, but uh, act naturally. I got to watch the Jets every Sunday. But I don't have time please, to, I don't have please. time to watch another book. Steve and I are diehard Jets fans, and dying hard is what we do very well with Jet, Jet fans. Um, Act Naturally, The Beatles on Film, Steve Matteo. Uh, it is out. It is on uh, Backbeat Books. And Steve, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you again for your time. Thank you, guys. It's always a pleasure doing this. I learn so much when I do this with you well, folks. You educated, you educated us, I think, this time yeah. uh, with this book. Okay. <laughs> thank you, Steve. Appreciate it. Thank you. Cheers. This was tremendous. Thank you, Steve. What a pleasure having Steve Matteo back with us here on Things We Said Today. I'm Darren DeVivo, Ken Michaels, Alan Cozen. Thrilled to have Steve and his new book, Act Naturally, The Beatles on Film. So let's put a wrap on things. Um, and we'll sum our personal stuff up for you. Uh, I'm on WFUV. You can catch me uh, Monday night through Thursday night, starting at 10 p.m. till 2 in the morning, um, and then Saturday afternoons from 1 to 4, uh, WFUV in New York City at 90.7 FM. But you can also listen online, our website, WFUV.org. You can listen anywhere on the globe. Uh, and also get our app, another way to listen to us. Um, and if you have a smart speaker, I don't exactly know how those work, you have a smart speaker, it will play WFUV, and you could catch me there. Ken? I'll make this quick. Uh, if you want to write to me, my email address is everylittlething at att.net. Every Little Thing is a radio show that I've been doing for 41 years now, which is on 50-plus uh, radio stations. If you want to listen to it, and this show just encompasses everything on the Beatles, group music, solo music, deep cuts, B-sides, rarities, cover versions, family members, you name it, and interesting thematic sets. If you want to catch that show, you can go to my website, kenmichaelsradio.com, and there's a page for every little thing, which lists all the radio stations that carry it and their times, and you, you can click on the individual websites and stream the show there. Okay, and my other... Uh, podcast show, Talk More Talk, a solo Beatles video cast. We've been on hiatus for a little more than a month. We're going to resume sometime in October. No doubt uh, all kinds of interesting shows we'll be doing. 
uh, lots of anniversaries to take note of, which we'll be doing here, I'm sure, as well. Um, and please visit my uh, my own YouTube channel, which is Ken Michaels Radio. Always new interviews on there. Beatles trivia shows as well, which are a lot of fun. And um, that's at Ken Michaels Radio. And please subscribe to both that and Talk More Talk and things we said today. All right. Helen? Okay, so I figure, you know, one of us has to not do any broadcasting. So that's me, except for this. <laughs> um, you can find me on Facebook uh, at Alan Cozen or Alan Cozen Remixed. Um, you can find me on Twitter. You can find me on Threads. It's just Alan underscore Cozen. Um, you can find a... Uh, a Facebook page for the McCartney legacy uh, called McCartney legacy. And we have a Twitter account too. You can write to all of us here on things we said today at um, things we said today, radio show at gmail.com. We answer if an answer is, you know, required. Like if you ask a question um, and if you want to send us ideas we consider them and discuss them and sometimes do them um so write to us and we also have two facebook pages at the moment uh things we said today and things we said today beatles radio fans so there we are all right and i neglected to mention i have two facebook pages as well if you want to track me down darren devivo and there's a second page as well uh, and it's a great way to keep in touch with me. Uh, and that's that's it for today's show. Again, thank you to Steve Matteo for being our guest. Uh, we will see you with a new show, hopefully in a couple of weeks, uh, Things We Said Today, and tell your friends about us. Ken Michaels, Alan Cozen, for my two friends, I'm Darren DeVivo, thanking you for spending a little time with us again today. Take care.